Welcome everyone to the virtual book launch for my new novel, Post from Suburbia, from Encircle Publications, uh, year of publish 2022, in case anyone's trying to find it. And uh, it will be available, it is available on all of uh, online outlets and uh, including Amazon, including Barnes & Noble, including bookshop.org. And it's also available at a number of brick and mortar outlets as well, and, and from the publisher in Circle Publications. Okay. I'm going to read a brief excerpt tonight and then um, tell you a little bit about the uh, genesis of the book and, um, and uh, answer any comments that I may get. Uh, and also um, offer the book at a discount, sign copies of the book to anyone who might be interested. So. Uh, I'll begin just by saying that the book is uh, about a young man who returns to the suburbs from uh, living in the city where he's lived for about oh, 15 years after his childhood in the suburbs. And he returns uh, having ended a relationship, having had one ended for him, to the town where his mother and uh, sister live. And that's the, that's the setup. So I'll read you one piece, one post. The novel is made up of posts um, written and posted on the narrator's blog. And I'll read you one of the posts about suburban weddings. This is called The Whole Nine Yards. Suzanne and I had planned to marry in her sister's backyard, then take a honeymoon in Wyoming. I was daydreaming of Suzanne when our mutual friend Shannon called to, tell, to let me know that she and her fiancé had chosen a wedding date. They would marry in the fall under a canopy in a city park, then have a picnic reception. It's a commute, but I'll definitely be there, I said, thinking as I did of all the other weddings I'd attended over the years, the suburban nuptials. You ever been to a wedding out here, I asked Shannon. No, not since I was a little kid. What are they like? The first one happened in the early 1990s. White tuxedos, pink cummerbunds. The groom was my cousin, and our family made no secret of our contempt for the bride's kinfolk. When my cousin knelt at the altar, the left and right tan soles of his black leather shoes screamed the magic marker words, help and me at his soon-to-be in-laws seated in the first pew. Later, on his way to the white limousine, his best man spewed a stream of Galliano liqueur onto the train of his bride's wedding dress. During the reception, my uncle, many sheets to the wind, led our men, led our men in a chorus of the Munchkin song from The Wizard of Oz as they stared down the bride's undersized relatives seated at their tables who then stood up for what it was worth and made a show of taking offense. The next wedding took place in the dining hall of a home for aged sailors. The band were a crew of geriatric vets who knew nothing post Bobby Darren. The whole night I listened to my aunts wondering aloud how the chef could dare serve french fries with chicken cordon bleu. That is when my aunts weren't busy criticizing the brides simple taffeta dress. Similar weddings happened throughout the era when women like my aunts opened bridal shops on every other suburban corner. Rainbow gowns, gigantic floral arrangements, disposable table cameras, mirrored centerpieces, Viennese hours. What's the difference, do you think, I asked Shannon, between a Viennese hour and a Viennese table? I think the hour is when you have the table. But why Viennese? Good question. But of course, it made sense. Vienna was a wealthy imperial city. Any couple who wanted a table full of cream-filled desserts at their wedding could afford to have it. An American father of the bride would insist on nothing less. This is America, top of the heap. There's enough cream in this country for 80 billion goddamn Napoleons. Viennese table, you kidding me? How many you want? We'll get the whole nine yards. Let's eat. Then 
There is the Viennese curtain, a concept I still don't fully comprehend. I think it's a visual thing, a tableau, said Shannon. That's what I remember, a living tableau. I remember a best man, an obese construction worker, trying to break dance, spinning like a weeble in the middle of the floor, bloodying his back. I remember mothers and grandmothers in pink chiffon dresses descending a freestanding spiral staircase at the poorly amplified goading of a professional wedding host. I remember plastic trees rooting and ramifying toward tables of eight from the center of a mirrored dining room. I remember the electric slide. And I remember fights breaking out over airborne garters and bouquets. On the subject of fights, I distinctly remember an attack by male members of my family on another wedding party occupying an adjacent room of the wedding hall. They launched this attack at the behest of the bride, one of whose maids of honor had had the dishonor of being fondled on her way into the ladies' room by the father of the other party's bride. Before the rest of us realized what was happening, men in tuxedos were careening through the lobby, knocking each other into the grandiose fiberglass replica of the Fontana di Trevi, winning the attention of the entire local police force. This sort of behavior found its roots in the mass consumption of cheap well liquor and in a tradition I've discovered at second hand, the wedding wedge. This is where, as the reception draws to a close, members of both families come together in the middle of the dance floor and form a giant wedge, which becomes a flying wedge as it heads for the door and out into the matrimonial night. It smacks of tribes girding for battle. The guests prefigure the great conflict they hold marriage and suburbia to be as they ready themselves for forced annual or, God forbid, semi-annual meetings with in-laws who are essentially strangers and are therefore not to be trusted. Seriously, some wild stuff happens at weddings. Well, not at my wedding, Shannon insisted. No wedding hall, no way. That reminds me. Did I ever tell you about Martins of Seacove? No. Martins is the granddaddy of all wedding halls. Its pink marble facade shrieks splendor to motorists who pass it as they cruise down State Route 25A. A red carpet leads from a horseshoe driveway to entrance doors into which are etched trains of elephants linked trunk to tail, shouldering howdahs bearing couples in the traditional marriage garb of many nations. I have only once had the privilege of patting Martin's red carpet, fixing my gaze upon these magic doors and stepping into its lobby from the eighth dimension. This lobby feels, in a literally tactile sense, different from any other. The entire floor is covered with beige shag carpeting. From the middle of the 40-foot high ceilings, ceiling hangs a 25-foot-long crystal obelisk chandelier. Arranged in concentric circles from the chandelier dangle slightly shorter illuminated crystal ropes. Beneath the chandelier stands an enormous centerpiece, a giant goldfish pond encircling an island of plastic flora. Pink leather couches like giant cow tongues line the walls decorated with tufted black and gold wallpaper. When I was 14, one of my cousins held her reception at Martin's. I remember following my Uncle Charlie down one of these endless corridors radiating from the lobby. Every 200 feet or so, we passed an open door. Each door gave on to another reception room, one wedding spectacle more bizarre than the last. Inside the first room, I watched an entire wedding party, easily 50 people, all in purple, form one of those wedding wedges march several times back and forth across the room, stop and execute a perfectly synchronized pinwheel around the designated cusp person, a stout mustachioed man burping along to the Pennsylvania polka. The next room was a cloud of smoke through which descended a curtain of light. This may have been the Viennese curtain of legend. The curtain grew brighter and brighter, began to sparkle, shimmer, until from nowhere, the bride appeared in its midst, clutching a bouquet of iridescent cactus flowers. 
From the third room issued the barking of dogs and clip-clop noises. A party of ten dressed in chaps, black riding coats and boots to match, trotted by on roan stallions, followed by a pack of English hunting dogs and a hundred lesser guests all headed toward a stone archway and beyond it a neatly manicured lawn inside a giant greenhouse of budding Martins. Our, our reception was, by Martin's standards, a relatively modest affair. The room featured black marble walls and a white tile floor. The wait staff dressed in shades of gray and the overhead lights flickered periodically. My cousin Maxine, the bride, had chosen the classic movie theme. Our waiter called my mother Madam and bowed. He served us square egg rolls under glass as appetizers, then entrees kept warm by gold cloches. A number of my female cousins were so moved by this elegance that late in the evening they gathered at the table closest to ours to compare bridal aspirations. For my reception, my cousin Samantha told the others, I want all the guests to be announced at the door like they're all famous actors. When I do mine, cousin Simone declared, I want better than that. I want me and my husband to stand there like the king and queen and shake the guests' hands and kiss them all as they come in. Elena, always the adventurous one, attacked Samantha and Simone for their conventionality and presented her alternative. I want our hall to have a retractable roof so the whole bridal party can parachute down onto the dance floor in tuxedos and dresses while the band plays Wind Beneath My Wings. The others ignored her. Then, I remember they all turned to my sister, five years old at the time, and asked, Dolores, what do you want when you get married? You want a big cake or a beautiful dress? Dolores shook her head. You want pretty flowers? No again. You want a tall, handsome husband? Dolores blushed. Ah, oh, come on, you can tell us. Dolores shut her eyes for a while and finally, through a pixie smile, whispered, but long enough for all to hear, I want to go play forever. Then she bolted from her chair, ran to our mother fox trotting on the dance floor, threw her arms around mommy's leg, and held on for dear life. And I'll read you uh, one more selection from the novel. This one is vaguely about spirituality. This is called Middleville Upanishad. My friend Arnold runs a small coffee, sh coffee shop in the city's perpetually bohemian quarter. He calls the shop Prana, which in Sanskrit means the breath of life among bodily functions. Every day, Arnold dresses all in black, his head of thinning gray hair crowned with a matching black fedora adorned with, sh adorned with shark's teeth. He strides around his shop like a drunken pimp. He strokes the velvet drapery and pats the Buddhist statuary that decorate his poet's nirvana. My spiritual life consists of visits to the local Roman Catholic Church. The trouble with these visits is I always remember what Catholic elders told us as children, that the church, that the true church, is not a cathedral's facade or its stained glass windows or incense or even priests and nuns. The church is its people. I remember this, and because I do, the church never seems to disappoint me. Still, I come early to watch the altar boys prepare the holy implements, chalices, clusters of bells, candle snuffers, and rehearse their steps. At first, I am buoyed. I see children, even teenagers, who take an interest in the spiritual, who believe in something greater than themselves. Then the boys begin to whisper. They're watching the doors. They wait as I did for the odd-looking men, the ones with limps and withered limbs, alone, dressed in black suits, roaming the aisles during mass, taking up collections in long-handled wicker baskets lined with green felt. The boys will snicker, as I did, and wait for the young girls to arrive with their parents. This is a celebration of life. This is church as community. It will last only as long as the boys and girls remain children. 
Then, like other parishioners, they'll come to Mass with their families, weakly shake a few hands as they enter, stake out favorable pews, disappear into Sunday missiles in the liturgy of the Word. After Mass, the family will rise as a unit and slip out for ice cream, past the congregation under the guise of sanctity. This is not the spiritual life I crave, but it is the one my family handed me. So, after a long hiatus, I started to show up for Mass every Sunday, or at least most Sundays. And each week, the priest intones, without variation, the same psalms, the identical canticles. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I come without family and sit alone, my hands folded in my lap, listening, rarely bothering to cough up an amen. No one looks my way. If I'm lucky, I'll sit close enough to someone to extend a hand and say at the right moment, peace be with you. Sometimes the person shaking my hand beats me to it, and I have to content myself with the meek response, and also with you. Now the altar boys have begun to snicker at me. If I'm not careful, one fine day the priest will ask me to take up collection. Then there are other men's bedecked wives and daughters whose flounces and frills drive me to covetousness and distraction from metaphysical concerns. In my early 30s, I find myself less resolute now than I was at 14. A few months ago, the distraction had become such that I started leaving church early to go home and masturbate. The first time I, started, I stopped going regularly to Sunday Mass, I was 18 years old. It was the year I left for the city, a community of spirits colliding as I came to see it. Now, here I was, suburban again, but no longer a kid. Suburbia drove me back into the church's arms, but the church, I'm afraid, can't hold, is losing me, and this time it may be for good. I find it difficult now to put down the Sunday paper, shave, don suitable clothes, arrive at church for the tolling of the bell. I submit easily to episodes of survival shows and afternoon baseball pod podcasts or military assault games on my phone. One day, Feeling especially mired in this spiritual morass, I traveled to Arnold's shop to sit, to sit, to unburden myself to someone who wouldn't judge. Arnold met me by the door, took my hands in his and held them in the grip of universal brotherhood. Hey man, he said, hey. Hey Arnold, how's life? Life is a constant struggle, but you know, beautiful. Can I sit? Oh, sure, sure. Let's sit in back. There's a bad aura by the front door today. We took a table near the counter. What's the matter, baby? Asked Arnold. You look worried. No, I'm not worried. I'm more um, upset. Oh, well, tell me, tell me. That's why I'm here. I patted his hand. Thanks. You're more than just a purveyor of exotic coffees. He smiled but didn't laugh. I appreciate that, man. Really. I'm just upset, distracted, maybe lonely, but it's not like a physical loneliness. It's more spiritual, disconnected. That's heavy. You're here every day with all these people, so maybe you don't know what it's like never to see anybody you know. My friends who live here don't even call anymore because I live out there. It's like if I come in on the train, I'll bring the plague in with me. He kept his eyes riveted on mine. No plague, he whispered, straight-faced. No plague. Well, I just, I don't know, I feel like hell. A very Christian concept. Yeah, I've gone back to church. I thought it would help, but it's just not doing it for me. It doesn't make sense. What doesn't? That you feel bad, it's, it's not right. Why? It's not that strange. A lot of people feel bad. Yeah, but you shouldn't. Well, why not? Because right now you have extremely good karma. He stood up. Stay right there, he said, making a calm down gesture with his open hands. He stepped behind the counter and soon the smell of coffee brewing filled the room. Arnold, uh, does that mean I have something good coming my way? 
Not exactly. That's more like Hindu karma. I have done a few nice things lately. I tolerate my neighbors. I talk to the mailman. I water my mother's plants. I hardly jerk off on Sundays anymore. No, man. It's not an external phenomenon. So it's probably more like luck, born under a guiding star. No, it's not predestination. Again, a Hindu concept. You might as well rely on your horoscope. No, it's, it's more about the inside. But that's the problem. I feel like hell on the inside. Not the problem, my son. Not the problem, he said, skirting the counter and placing before me a cup of steaming brown liquid. I pointed to the cup. What's that? That, my young friend, that is... He closed his eyes, leaned his head back. Mm. Arnold, Arnold? He opened his eyes. I pointed to the cup again. What is it? It's coffee, he said with mild annoyance. What else would it be? Thanks, I grumbled out. I'll try it. He sat down. It's good. I like it. Sumatran Satori. But to be honest, it doesn't help me feel any better. That's the point. Come again? That's the point. It doesn't make you feel better. And even if I added some steamed milk and topped it with mocha cinnamon powder, it still wouldn't help. He leaned forward on his elbows. You know, man, it makes me laugh. I see these kids come in here dressed all in black like me, and they don't even know what it means. They get on the train like you did, they come into the city, they come to me, they're always brooding, they stare at the statues, they sit at the tables and they'll talk to one another, and I'm supposed to make that all better with a nice double decaf mochaccino and a few observations about reality. I know what you mean. When I go to church, I see all the people file in and shake hands and say the prayers, and a lot of them even sing the hymns, but I don't think I've ever smiled at a single one of them. They don't smile. They don't even look at me. See, baby, the avatar has appeared. Isn't that Hindu? Yeah, but it works for you. Who are we to judge? The point is, you know that coffee isn't going to help you make it. Naturally, that's good karma. I'm, I'm confused. Think, he said, touching an index finger to each of my temples. If you know you feel like shit, that's awareness, that's self, that's karma. In the Buddhist sense, it all comes from within. I took another sip of coffee, let it soak my palate, swallowed. That's true. I know I feel like shit, but the thing is that I still feel like shit. And the funny thing is that I didn't before I moved back to the suburbs. That may be true. That may be true. Still, I must tell you that searching yourself is the only way. Searching myself. Close your eyes. I closed my eyes. I could hear Arnold take a deep breath. Now, take a deep breath. I obeyed. That's it. Just repeat that without breaking the cycle. The door of the shop swung open and a group of black-clad teenagers entered, whispering. Arnold, listen, that part about the self, that, that really helps. But I'm not so sure about the, um, the karma drill. Just go home, pick a nice soft chair, close your eyes, concentrate on the quiet. What if my neighbor has his lawnmower going? Just close your eyes. You'll see. Karma, baby. Karma. When it's good in here... It's good out there. Arnold turned to acknowledge the table of teens, then to me again. Hey, I'm glad you came down. It's a struggle, I know. Just hang in, baby. Hang. We hugged, and I left Arnold to his patrons. I walked the city streets, deep, graffitied, like prehistoric caves, until I reached the terminal. I searched my pockets for a train schedule. People shoved past me as I stood in front of the station's entrance. I was staring at the schedule, but for some reason couldn't focus my eyes to read it. For a moment, I was stuck in time and space. As I stood there, one question rang in my ears. Where are you going? But then I thought, there's always another train. God has seen at least to that. Thank you, everybody. Um, 
If you PM me or if you would prefer to email me at ggguida at citytech.cuny.edu, I will uh, send you a signed copy of Post from Suburbia for the fabulous price of $12. Um, limited supplies, unfortunately, but if you, you know, first come, first serve. Uh, as I said, if you aren't able to get it that way, it is also available on just about every online outlet I can think of and many um, bricks and mortar shops as well. So thank you for looking in and thanks again to Encircle Publications. Um, and I wish you all a good night and good reading.